Hello and welcome everyone to this video. I'm Jamar Roble Tan and today I will be introducing environmental lobbying, what it is, how it is done, and some examples of successes and victories achieved through environmental lobbying. This video is a student created open educational resource and it is my hope that this video can enhance other educational materials about environmental advocacy. First, to understand what environmental lobbying is, we must examine what lobbying means. The word lobby can refer to a group of people that works to persuade officials, especially members of a legislature, to support a group's special interests. These groups may be seeking changes in governmental policies of social, economic, and or environmental importance. Oftentimes, interest groups seek to influence the actions of legislators by urging or procuring for the passage of a certain bill. And in fact, the word lobbying itself came about as a reference to the custom of interest groups to gather in the entrance halls that is, the lobbies of legislative chambers. This was done so that these lobbyists could corner legislators and more effectively influence their decision making. Environmental lobbying is concerned with environmental issues, especially those of ecological importance. Environmental lobbying is the means by which pro-environment sentiments gain form and manifest as legislation, laws, and policies. This is important because laws and policies reflect what is acceptable and what is valuable to a society. Environmental laws and policies can also establish mechanisms and tools to protect the environment and a nation's people in the long term. Laws and policies could establish, for example, sanctions against illegal loggers and dynamite fishers, systems to monitor bioprospectors, proper waste management policies that protect natural resources such as groundwater, and allocations of financial and human resources to support environmental initiatives. Lobbying can be put simply as being comprised of three steps. First, to facilitate the following steps, the language of a bill should be proposed or agreed upon by an interest group. Then, key public officials are identified and targeted as the audience of the lobbying efforts. To keep things manageable, a relatively small number of public officials should be selected. These public officials would ideally be as yet undecided about their position regarding the bill. Resources for lobbying may be inefficiently utilized if attempts are made to change the minds of public officials who already decided upon their position regarding the bill. Lastly, attempts must be made to convince the targeted public officials to support the bill or cause. Common methods by which to do this are described in the next slide. To maintain public support, it would be ideal for interest groups to keep the general public informed about the status of the bill throughout the decision-making process. This may continue even beyond the passage of the bill, as updates reporting on the implementation of the resultant policy changes. In planning a lobbying project, Interest groups might note that the length and procedures involved with the decision-making process depend on the setting, region, country, level of government, and other factors involved. We may argue that there are actually two forms of lobbying. Greenfield differentiates direct lobbying from grassroots lobbying in the following way. Direct lobbying is a term that can be used to refer to any communication with a legislator that expresses a view about specific legislation. And this is what is conventionally associated with the term lobbying. Grassroots lobbying, on the other hand, 
is any communication involving the general public that expresses a view about specific legislation and which includes a call to action. Per meta, a call to action may be one of four things. One, asking the public to contact their local legislators or their staff. Two, providing contact information of legislators to the public. Three, providing a mechanism to send a message directly to the legislators from the public, such as postcards, petitions, letters, or emails, or even websites. Or four, listing the names and stances of legislators voting on a bill for review of the public. Direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying may both be carried out for any given campaign. Thus, all in all, lobbying may involve letter writing campaigns, emails, television, radio, social media, advertisements, donations of funds, speeches at public hearings, calls to legislators' offices, endorsements of candidates running for office, public demonstrations, and other media and activities. On this note, author and environmentalist Robert Cox may argue that narrow casting information to the intended legislators would be most efficient. With limited resources, Lobbyists should be selective about the channels through which they intend to reach their intended demographic. Some recent successes gained by environmental lobbying are shown on this slide. For example, Alex Lynn of Westerly, Rhode Island influenced the state of Rhode Island to pass a bill requiring the proper disposal of electronic waste throughout the state in 2006. Alex's team got petitions signed, made presentations, and even spoke out at the Rhode Island State House in order to accomplish this. Robert Bryan of Manitoba, Canada persuaded the government of Manitoba to ban logging in nearly a million acres of local forests. Robin organized rallies, went door to door to gather support, spoke with elected officials, fundraised, conducted classroom presentations, and carried out other such activities to raise awareness about the threat of logging to this wilderness area. Lastly, the Mother Earth Foundation in the Philippines currently conducts ongoing projects that use direct lobbying in having local governments implement zero-waste policies in their areas in a form of grassroots lobbying by promoting environmental education and zero-waste practices in schools and barangays. Clearly, environmental lobbying is one of the most important forms of environmental communication in contemporary environmentalist movements. In fact, Librero and Canonizado maintain that it is political, ethical, and in some cases criminal negligence not to bring to the legislature's attention environmental concerns. However, we see that in order to be effective, lobbying efforts must be 1. Well planned, 2. Supported by at least one cohesive organization, and 3. Sustained. Policy changes do not happen overnight. I'd like to take this time to thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something and enjoyed it. If you appreciate this open educational resource, you may wish to use it to enhance educational materials regarding environmental advocacy for your classroom setting or in your environmental advocacy campaigns. Have a good day. Thank you.